are still amazed by the love of God. An incredible thing, right? I stand amazed in the praise of Jesus the
Lord, we know you've been good to us. You've been faithful to us. You've been merciful to us. Lord, you've been better to us than we deserve. Thank you that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Father, we thank you that you heal our diseases. You restore relationships and marriages. Lord, you, you are a redeemer, Lord, of things that have been lost and stolen out of our lives. Lord, we thank you that you've been good to us. We bless you today. We honor you. We love you. We extol and magnify the name that is above every other name today. We thank you for it. Come on, say it with me. He's done so much for me. I can't. I can't. appreciate you coming by and spending some time with us on Sunday morning. If you're joining us online, we also want to welcome you today. Thank you for some time today around his word and in the presence of the Lord together. Hey, just a couple of things um, as we look towards this week. Um, also, we have, if, if you're our guest today, uh, in the pew rack in front of you should be a, a connect card and we'd love the opportunity to this week to connect with you. If you take a moment and uh, fill that, that card out and uh, turn it in at the kiosk or slip it in one of the hands of the ushers and uh, we'll connect with you this week. That would mean the world to us to be able to connect with you. And uh, also we are uh, following guidelines. So at the conclusion of our time together today, our ushers will help us uh, and dismiss from the back to the front. And uh, they'll help us with that in just a little while. And also, we're not passing our offering uh, buckets or receptacles, but they are located out. The boxes are located out on the kiosk. And so just for that, hey, young people, uh, FAM is meeting this week. You, you may have noticed Pastor Bryce and Miss Haley are out, but they're going to be able to be back in full swing this week, back at work, back at school, back in church. And so we look forward to seeing them. And they are telling me they got some some good things planned for this Wednesday night in the gym. For those of you uh, that are here watching online, our young people are going to be able to meet again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the gym. Also, uh, for those of us that aren't, aren't coming to the gym, we I am uh, going to show uh, on Facebook, we're going to do another Maximizing Missions this week. I am, uh, last week, I was uh, blessed to, to interview Miss Heidi, and I, I hope you have seen that. And if you haven't had time to watch that, that'll stay up for a little while. She tells us about Heart and Home Ministry, and uh, they're doing just a great a great job uh, at Heart and Home Ministry and all the things that they're involved in. And uh, But this week, I'm interviewing Dr. John Bosman, and uh, he's been with us many times here in the service, And uh, but they are doing a great work in the nation of South Africa, and uh, they're doing a lot of feeding programs. He does a lot of teaching and training for pastors in that nation. 
Uh, that's that's really where he he and Sister B are from, and uh, they've been in the United States for many many years. But um, I'm interviewing him about the work that they're doing in South Africa, and so I know it'll uh, it'll bless your heart. So. Uh, hopefully you'll take some time and watch Maximizing Missions with us. I'm certainly enjoying getting to know these missionaries and, and the work on their field a little bit more. And uh, I, t I hope you'll take some time and watch those with us. Once again, welcome to Exciting First Assembly. So delighted that you are here today. And now let's continue to worship the Lord together. The Lord is my salvation. And I'm thankful for that today.
Would you play this, Wendy, my Jesus? I love you.
Father, thank you for the sweet peace of Jesus that's in this room today. Lord, as we open your word and draw our attention around it for the next few moments, Lord, I ask you one more time to maximize our time in your word. Lord, speak clearly to us. Give us direction. Open spiritual ears to hear what you have to say to us today. And I thank you, Lord, for it. We thank you for it today. We simply love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The book of Ephesians is where we have been for the last uh, several weeks. And uh, we are in chapter 2 again this morning. And, and I am just going to uh, recap just for a moment Ephesians chapter number 2. A couple of verses that I'll pull from the beginning of this uh, particular chapter. And then Dr. Dan will come and he will close out uh, chapter 2. We'll have a declaration and then we will, um, we will be blessed. Hey, I just want to uh, give a, a little bit, really a shout out. I, I, I know you guys, uh, it's, we've, been on, we've been locked down and then pandemic. And, and, uh, but, you know, Sagu has, uh, what, what a blessing Sagu is. Most of us in this room have been somehow touched, influenced by Sagu down through the years. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of professors uh, attend church here, and, and we certainly love them and, and appreciate them. But uh, today at 3 o'clock, Professor Blunt is, you know, he is the professor over the, uh, I guess, the theater department. And they are, they have had all weekend one of their musicals. And uh, Bella and I went yesterday afternoon, and it is just incredible. And so it's in the main auditorium, plenty of room to social distance. It's at 3 o'clock. It'll be one that you probably recognize that they're, they're doing. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. And I sat there yet last night just reminiscing from when I was a kid and watching Charlie Brown. And, and uh, it's just an incredible thing. If you're available at 3 o'clock today, go. There's no admission. It's, it's free to get in there. And uh, so I know, I know the school and certainly uh, Professor Blunt would uh, enjoy having you. And so that's at 3 o'clock today. Ephesians. Chapter number two, verse number eight and nine. Familiar passage, it's where we really landed. And then I'm going to close out with verse number 12 today. But this is what the Bible says, reading out of the Amplified Version. For it is by grace, which is God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life. Here's the key, through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not of your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God. Verse 9, not as a result of your works, nor your attempt to keep the law, so that none one, no one will be able to boast or to take credit in any way for this salvation. It is by grace that through faith, remember the spiritual uh, blessings that we talked about, we're saved through grace, and it's by faith. And so I mentioned to you last week, and I'll say it again. If you are out of relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have to get fixed up to receive Christ. You come just like you are. That's one of the beautiful things about a relationship with Jesus. He's waiting. His arms are open, and he's saying, come on, I want you. I love you. You are mine, and let me, let me help you. And that is available. The gift of salvation is available to us. And then the Apostle Paul, in verse number 12, he goes and, and, and he reminds us of, the, of, of really who we were before we had the gift, before we came to a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what he says in verse number 12. Remember that at the time you were separated from Christ, you were excluded from any relationship with him, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, you were strangers to the covenant of the promise. You were with no share in the sacred messianic promise and without knowledge of God's agreement, having no hope in his promise and living in the world without God. And so Paul reminds us in verse number 12 again, he said, this is who you were before you, before Christ. You were separated from God. 
You were walking in the flesh. You were rejected and you were criticized. You didn't have any knowledge of the promises of God. You didn't have any hope. And you were in the world without God. And that was our condition, Paul says in verse 12. But now, in Christ, we have been brought near and the broken the, the wall has been broken down between us and what that simply means is that now because of the gift of god because of jesus christ you and i can relate to him the wall that separated us the gulf of sin that separated us we is now abolished because of the work of jesus christ and the work of god and we can relate to him we can have access to him through Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm so thankful today for the gift of salvation. Dr. Dan's coming and he's going to pick up with verse number 13. He's going to explain to us about the, the atonement of Jesus Christ. Come on, Dr. Dan. And I'm cleaning this for you. See right here. <laughs> so many levels, Pastor Carl. Don't you appreciate Carl and Cindy? Richard. Praise the Lord. Well, we, uh, we are right here in uh, uh, Ephesians 2.13. We have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Glory to his name. You know, prior to the New Testament, there was a clear distinction between the Jews of the Old Testament and the rest of the world. There was a small provision for God-fearers, that's what they call them, who would come from the Gentiles into the worship of God. But the coming of Christ made it possible for anyone to draw near when the message was accepted. Here in verse 13, it says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in verse 14, Paul describes this redemptive act as Jesus is peace personified. Because of what he did, he became our peace. There's no longer Jew and Gentile. Uh, Jesus has brought them together in one act. He brought unity between groups. Now, we've, been, we've known about this for 2,000 years. I mean, since Jesus ascended, that was the one act then that brought both groups together. In our churches, we don't make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. We don't say the Jews sit over here and the Gentiles over here. I mean, when I taught Old Testament, and back in the days when it was a large class and everybody had to take it, we were in this big room that had a gap in the middle. And I would... And I would have to get them to take the roll. Somebody would have to take the roll sheet to the next section. And so to make it easy, I'd say, you know, who's going to take the gospel to the Gentiles? Right? I mean, Jews are up here in the front. Gentiles are in the back. But, you know, we were just playing with that. Right? But the, but the simple fact is, because of what Jesus has done, we've, been, we've become comfortable with this idea that we don't have to, we don't have to do a, bit, a lot of activity to get to Christ. All we have to do is believe. It's still the best news ever. He brought unity between groups. Now, what's fascinating in the, in the social context that we're in right now, where you can turn on the news and you can see protesters uh, storming the Capitol. And everybody gets upset. You can see protesters in the uh, recent one I saw in Portland and burning and all this kind of stuff. And you know... It, something visceral happens when you see images like that. You think, those folks ought to. I mean, you know, you just, it's just a human thing. But what this Bible is telling us is because Jesus has come, all that could go away if, they would if we would just live out the gospel. All that could go away. And I know it's, it's kind of a crazy thought, but look at verse 14. He is our peace. Lord. Like, I know we pray for the peace of God and all that kind of stuff, but He's it. He's the one. He is our peace. We sang about it. Who made both groups one 
and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. What a statement. In his flesh, he did this. You see, all the laws and regulations, as the writer of Hebrews makes so clear, are not effective in helping a person draw close to God. We can see this looking at our world. Being nice is not possible on human terms. Our nation's so divided, we don't even, it's like we've forgotten how to be nice. But in Christ, we can be nice. Somebody say amen. amen. He is our peace. Because of what he has done, he has brought a abiding and persistent peace. Look at verse 15. His work created peace for us. Look, at verse 15 says, He made of no effect. Think about this. The law, consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that He might create in Himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. Now, as we look at that, that's, that's really saying something. That's saying if you're, a, if you're a Republican and you ask Jesus in your heart, you can have peace. If you're a Democrat, you can ask Jesus in your heart and have peace. Glory. You can be an atheist or an agnostic and hostile to God, but when he comes inside, he changes everything and you can have peace. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's, you know, he and, then, and this next phrase, the, he put hostility to death. Think about this. He put hostility to death. Look at verse 16. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put hostility to death. Glory. I mean, we've got, we've got this beautiful cross up here. I'm so glad it's up there. I'm so glad you can change the colors on it, keep it looking pretty. I mean, I'm glad it's big. And let me tell you something. That's an important symbol. Because I've heard, I've heard let me put it to I've heard critics say, I wouldn't, you know, if my best friend was killed by a revolver, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear a revolver around my neck. That's a complete misunderstanding of the redemptive act of Christ. That cross changed from hostility to peace. Right? When you, it means he completely changed it. It's, it's now hope. Right? I mean, hey, I'm not trying to boast, but it was such a privilege being a chaplain in the army because I got to wear one on my collar all the time. Right? I'm like, hey, it's a privilege to represent the cross. Right? And, and here's the thing. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, get excited about all that, but let me tell you something. Because you belong to Jesus, you're a walking cross. You're walking peace. You're sharing the best news in the world, whoever would hear it and understand it. Think about this. He put hostility to death. It's not like, and this is important, especially for those of us who are raised in church. Sometimes, those of us who are raised in church, we act, like, we act a lot more like the Jews of the Old Testament than the Christians of the New. It's not like the peace is forced or a label of peace in name only, but the hatred is gone. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus doing such a work in our lives that we don't hate anymore. Oh, start the work in me, Lord Jesus. He put hostility to death. Being a Christian ought to change everything. And what he's, what he's saying is prejudice is gone. Pride has been replaced by love. Paul says here in verse 16, it is true reconciliation where he makes this play on words. He put hostility to death. 
So it's almost like he's saying it's hard to be an angry Christian. Because, because he, he took my sins away. He took the burden away. He gave me his love. And so, and I'm preaching to myself. I shouldn't have to get mad at the world for acting like the world. Jesus is the only answer for that world. He proclaimed good news of peace. Look at verse 17. This next point is that in these next few verses, we discover the, the watershed effect of the, this great redemptive act. To the near and the far away, he came, verse 17, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away. That's easy. And peace to those who are near. I'll tell you a little secret at my when I'm when I'm talking to my students about salvation and doctrine class and everything. I'm like, look, the gospel is for lost people, and it's for the whole world. But you're not going to do the world any good until you discover that the gospel's for you. The gospel applies to a Sagu student as much as it does to anybody else. The gospel applies to everybody in First Assembly. Somebody say, Amen. Right? I mean, because he redeemed us, it's easy to serve him. It's easy to live for him. It's easy to pray. And even when it's not, we can look up to him and say, Lord, I'm having trouble with this, but I know you can help me. Amen? Amen. And it's verse 8. It's, it's like, hey, this is a subtle yet powerful point, verse 17, as it shows that the Jews who were near who knew the Old Testament, who had worshipped the God. We're talking about the people that left Egypt with Moses. Okay, They'd seen God's mighty act. What he's saying is they needed redemption just like the Gentiles. Those who are near need redemption. Those who are far away need redemption. I remember as a kid, church, they'd bring in these, these evangelists that would spend half the time on their first sermon talking about all the stuff that they did, right? You know, this, you've probably had the same experience, some of y'all. Like, I sold drugs, I did this, I did that, I did this. Travels, like the conversation about the, the, the $20 bill and the $1 bill, you know, the 20 boasts. I've been around the world and it says to the $1 bill, what have you done? And I'm not so much, it's just been church, 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 <laughs> right? And so, so listen, listen. You hear sometimes that kids growing up in church, they hear about all this great grace that was extended to these horrendous sinners. And, you know, if you think in the flesh, you think, man, I got cheated. I didn't have a chance to sin. Right? Like, like here, I've been nice this whole time. We find ourselves in an elder brother, just like the parable that Jesus told. The problem in the, in the, in the prodigal son was that the prodigal son was not just the one that ran off, but the one that stayed home too. Right? He stayed home mad. Right? And something had to happen in his life too. Right? And so what's being said here in verse 17 is everybody needs him. Right? To the near and to the far away. We all have access to the Father right now. I mean, you know, hey, we pay money to get good wireless access. Do we not? And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And boy, you know these days when the wireless access doesn't, doesn't work. But what a concept that 24-7, because the price was paid 2,000 years ago, we have access all the time. Right? We can call on His name. We, as dysfunctional as your frame, your worldview, your problems can get, you can look up and say, I do not serve this world. I serve you. And I need your help. I need you to step down and do something righteous. Step down and do something great. And solve this problem in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Right? Because he's, he's more than able to do it. He has already put hostility to death. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just as frustrated as the next person about 
how our world has taken a turn of division. But let me tell you what the Bible says about this. The darkest time can be the church's finest hour. Go on and ask him to do the impossible. Go on and ask him to do something big and grand. That, that person at work that, that you have trouble with, God can redeem them. He can save them. And, hey, it's right here in the Bible. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Not once a year, but 365 days a year. Every day is Easter because of this grand act of redemption. We can rejoice when the victory comes and get on our knees in intercession with, through the struggles of this life. Isaiah was right when he prophesied that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. And then we get to verse 19. Our status has changed. You know, I heard, I think it was Dr. George Wood said, the church is the only place where the rich and the poor can co-mingle and become friends, right? Because, because we have both needed to be redeemed, right? And one of these days, we're gonna, we're gonna see a church where, where it's obvious that we love everybody. Think about it. It's possible to understand that, that, that God entering a person's life and frame can affect everything they do. Our values, our, the way we treat people, the way we think about them. Our status has changed. And so Paul's just like it's been done. Verse 19, it's right here. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers. But fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. It was not a secret to be kept. Membership in the kingdom of heaven has been provided. No longer strangers. Citizens of God's household. Think about it. Right now, you and me, right now, we are citizens of God's household. I'm in. You're in. Right? Because of what he did. You, you don't have to. You don't have to write another check. You don't have to. You don't have to be nice anymore. Right? In other words, to try to get his favor. His favor has already been thrown down on you. And me. Praise God. The reason we write checks and be nice is because of what he's done. Right? Inside of here. Glory to God. It says... You're members of God's household right now. Citizens of God's household. I love that. And then we get to the last two verses. We'll preach ourselves happy, okay? We have a new home. My mother used to, used to, when she cleaned, I would hear her singing, and she would be cleaning. I, the memory in my mind is her cleaning around the edge of the bathtub, and and the strong smell of the chemicals, I remember, okay? And uh, she would be singing, just wait till you see my brand new home. Glory to God. Glory to God. Your heart and water's not working. Wait till you see your brand new home. <laughs> right? He says it right here in verse 20. Built. Look, go back to verse 19. Follow the logic. Members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Oh, the wonder of that. Glory to God. Peter referred to this in his epistles as exceeding great and precious promises. The Old Testament had longed for this day as Jeremiah predicted the righteous branch from the house of David about a time when the law would no longer be written on tablets of stone but written on our hearts. Yes, 
the faithfulness of Habakkuk and Micah and Zephaniah and Zerubbabel and Isaiah would talk about this wonderful counselor that would come. Oh, the mighty God and the foundation with Christ himself as the cornerstone. First Peter 2, 4 and 5 say this, as you come to him, a living stone, Rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God. You yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He finishes his point by referring to the everyday experience of those who come to know Christ. What Paul described in Romans 8 about the help of the Spirit we have right now, right now, as regularly as the air we breathe. What an ideal and at the same time a 24-7 reality for the believer in these last two verses. Constructed in him, we are home for God's spirit. Think of that. In him, the whole building. Being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. You see, all that that we've said so, thus far this morning is possible. All the love, all the putting hostility to death, all the, all the angst and anger that's in our culture, we carry the best news ever. And it's the love of God for humanity. I try, to, I try to help my students say this, like, you know, I don't know how to evangelize. Let me tell you something. It's real easy. When they start griping and they start talking about all their problems and they, my this and my that, look them in the eye and say, hey, I can't do anything about that, but I've got a God that can and, and let, will you let me pray for you? And when you dare to pray for someone, the Holy Spirit himself, because why? You're a, you're a dwelling place for his spirit, right? You dare to pray and God shows up. Does wonders. We just got to give him half an opportunity. And so, that's verse 22. In him you also be built up for God's dwelling in the spirit. Now, we're going to stand... And we have a declaration. Let's all stand. This is, this is our declaration for today. I declare that God is faithful to his word. And he has blessed me with spiritual blessings. I declare that I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. I declare, I declare that God has a good plan for my life. I declare that through the sacrifice of Christ's work on the cross, I have unlimited peace, unlimited hope, and unlimited access to the Father. I declare that I'm a member of God's household, a holy temple to the Lord, a place where God's Spirit can live. This is my declaration. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, brother. A dwelling place for his spirit. Wow, that, that's, it's awesome to think about that. Woo. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate your sharing. We're going to continue next week. Start with Ephesians chapter 3. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May your home be blessed. May your children be blessed. Be blessed coming in and going out. To the glory of God, walk in favor, walk in divine health, and know the grace and peace 
of Almighty God. Hey, we love you. Remember, FAM is meeting Wednesday night, and the rest of us will be online with Maximizing Missions. Have a wonderful afternoon. We love you. We'll see you again real soon. And I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. Brand new.